So good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by recognizing where we're hosting the webinar from today. I respectfully acknowledge the Lukongan speaking people on whose traditional territory the Capitol Park office stands, as well as the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich people whose historical relationship with this land continues today. Uh, my name is Avery Gottfried, a Senior Policy Specialist and Unit Head for the Circular Economy and Solid Waste Unit within the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change Strategy. Joining me today as co-presenter is Aaron Prescott, a Senior Policy Analyst on the team who's helping lead the engagement and bring together all the information and ideas as we move through this process. Aaron will be presenting later on in the webinar and will be going through the policy approaches that were included in the discussion paper. The objectives for today's webinar is to provide an overview of all the information that has been included in the discussion paper that was released on April 23rd. With this discussion paper, the ministry is looking for your ideas on how to advance the prevention and diversion of non-residential packaging and paper products in BC. With a bit of background, I'll go through. So in BC, since 2019, the ministry has been taking actions to prevent plastic waste as outlined in the Clean BC Plastics Action Plan. As part of the B this Plastics Action Plan was the release of an extended producer responsibility five-year action plan, and that was released in 2021. That plan outlined actions that would take place until 2026. So within that plan was the commitment to identify policy approaches for the non-residential packaging and paper products and that commitment was to have a policy approach uh, identified by 2025. So today we will review what's included in the scope to help define what is included in non-residential sector. We'll also outline the opportunities and review all the desired outcomes that are being proposed as part of this work. I'll then be handing it over to Aaron who will go through several possible policy approaches that have been included in the paper to start that discussion and provide ideas on what future policies can look like to address the non-residential sector. And as part of this, as always, we're looking for your input uh, through the engagement on more ideas uh, about how we can address the non-residential sector. So working towards identifying policy approaches for non-residential packaging, the ministry is seeking your input on a series of desired outcomes and potential policy approaches. Given the complexity of the non-residential packaging waste sector, it's anticipated that a combination of actions and a phased approach will be required. The most important message we wanna deliver is that the ministry is inviting you to contribute your knowledge and ideas to inform the development of policy approaches that will improve the prevention of residential, non-residential, also known as ICI packaging waste in communities across BC. And then those are a few tongue twisters as we continue to use the non-residential ICI, but we'll get into that a little bit more about what terminology we're gonna to continue to use as uh, we move forward with this work. There's several questions on this slide that we're seeking your thoughts throughout the engagement that will help us determine how we can prevent more packaging waste from this non-residential sector. And then as mentioned before, all information uh, we do encourage to be submitted by July 23rd as part of this 90 day engagement period. So BC has positioned itself as a leader nationally and internationally in acting against plastics waste and pollution. The Plastics Action Plan came forward with a combination of strategic policy, funding and regulation to stimulate the movement of plastics into the circular economy in British Columbia. Released in 2019, the Clean BC Plastics Action Plan focused government actions in three key areas. This included implementing bans on plastics and single-use items, and those restrictions began to come into force at the end of 2023. There's also actions to reduce plastic waste, and this has come forward with uh, primarily through uh, funding programs that have been implemented. The first one is the Clean Coast, Clean Waters program. And just a few updates on that program that applications have been accepted through the last two years and that window for applications for this summer's cleanup just closed in mid April. Announcements will be made soon for su successful applicants and that will be to allow to con the continued shoreline cleanup and derelict vessel removal through the summer and fall of this year. The other opportunity is the Clean BC Plastics Action Fund. 
And it's important to note that this application period is still open for the plastics action fund and is remaining open till all funds have been allocated or the end of this year in December, 2024. Um, so you can go to our website listed on this slide to get more information about all these programs. And if you are interested in the Clean BC Plastics Action Fund, we do really encourage you to re reach out to our fund, uh, fund administrator and do more. So the other uh, third point on this one is just to get into the non-residential packaging on the reducing plastics overall. So again, as mentioned, that's through our extended producer responsibility five-year plan. And, but there are many other actions that have taken place to date and uh, to expand EPR programs as well, including changes to, uh, which began with changes to the beverage container deposit refund program, and that have included other expansion areas that are in the works. With this, it's just a highlight that to address plastic waste, multiple approaches, including regulations, funding programs, Indigenous partnerships, and business-led initiatives, we're all required to see BC uh, help minimize our use of plastics and then ensure that those plastics are used are moved to the circular economy. So just a bit more background on, on the timelines and where we're gonna where we're aiming to get towards. So as I mentioned, the five-year action plan uh, covers the years of 2021 to 2026. And it uh, included several commitments, including regulating more products through EPR, and as well as evaluating other waste prevention policy approaches. So as part of the five-year action plan, we're continuing our work towards identifying those policy approaches to manage packaging and paper from the non-residential sector. And it's important to note in the way we we're presenting this work that we know it's a combination of both EPR and non-PR EPR approaches that are under consideration. Our ministry recognizes that ICI sector is complex and requires a measured phased approach. We're working to determine a policy approach that will manage these non-residential materials that drives for the best environmental outcomes, considers the management systems already in place, as well as supporting uh, economic solutions that are supporting a circular economy. Some of the major work completed so far in this area have included uh, work with the Canada Plastics Pact, which began in late 2021, to identify the baseline flow of non-residential and ICI packaging waste that's uh, currently being managed in BC. In 2022, the ministry also helped create an ICI working group that was focused on North Central BC to identify potential interim opportunities to address ICI packaging waste in rural and remote communities uh, through non-regulatory actions, as well as cooperation between communities and business partners. This group comprised representatives from local governments, indigenous communities, as well as many uh, or a few associations that uh, gave their time. I'd like to thank everyone for the time they gave to be part of that working group. And, but overall, you know, there was a lot of identified shared challenges and experiences working in rural and regional communities regarding non-residential packaging. And over uh, some of the outcomes were emphasizing the need for provincial long-term solutions in these areas. So with this, we've taken some of these learnings from the working group and have now uh, built them into the discussion paper that has been released. In terms of the full overall process, after this engagement, we aim to publish a What We Learn report by the end of this year. And that will help us continue on the trajectory of identifying a policy approach um, by uh, in the year 2025. At this time, we cannot commit to what actions will be take, taking place in 2025, as we yet need to wait for this engagement to conclude and review the information that's being got, that ends up being gathered through the engagement. Typically, if regulatory changes are being considered, the next step would be an intentions paper that would be a published to identify uh, the details of that policy approach, along with future engagement prior to any implementation taking place. So I'll take a moment to define what is meant by the non-residential sector, um, also commonly called in our industry, the industrial, commercial and institutional sector. The non-residential or ICI sector is comp comprised of a diverse source of waste. The definition of ICI waste includes all waste generated from all non-residential sources and basically is any waste other than that waste coming from the residential waste stream. This includes light industrial waste, which is waste generated by manufacturing 
primary and secondary industries. And it's the waste that is managed offsite from these manufacturing operations through municipal solid waste programs. Institutional waste is any waste generated by facilities such as schools, hospitals, government facilities, uh, living long-term care homes or universities. And then commercial waste is any waste generated by commercial operations. Some examples could be shopping centers, offices, businesses, uh, hotels, or restaurants. With this in mind, I'll now move on to what's de defer defined for the full scope as non-residential packaging. So what is non-residential packaging? Overall, packaging is any, anything that is used to protect, contain, or transport a product, or anything attached to a product or container for the purpose of marketing or communicating information about the product. This also includes packaging-like products, such as food containers, wraps, bags, boxes, and other items that are supplied to consumers for the purpose of protecting, containing, or transporting products. This could be made of any material type. It can include plastic, but also includes uh, paper, box board, glass, metal, um, and, and other formats as well. In our work with the Canada Plastics Pact uh, to look at the current ICI packaging sector, the baseline report looked at both business waste audits and landfill reporting to present that overview of the types and quantities of packaging but overall, it identified significant gaps in, in waste reporting for the non-residential sector. With this, the non-residential packaging is more diverse than the residential packaging and consists of both business-to-consumer packaging as well as business-to-business -business packaging. So some of the business-to-consumer packaging items we're all familiar with as they're identical to those items that are found in our residential streams and are uh, covered through our residential recycling programs. There's also many packaging materials that are specific to business to business applications. And it may be unique to one source, such as an agricultural operation in, our, in, in a farm, at a construction site, or specific to a medical facility. But with this, there's other types of packaging that uh, are in scope, and it can include everything from wood pallets to large format containers that are used in business-to-business -business transactions and are also quite uh, some uh, good reuse applications that take place in that business-to-business -business packaging uh, sector. So using these definitions, the overall scope includes all non-residential packaging and paper products. So I'll move into why we're focusing on non-residential packaging. Municipal solid waste, including packaging and plastics, poses a challenge in BC as it's filling up our landfills, contributes to litter and pollution, and is increasingly more expensive to manage. Waste management, including disposal, has significant economic costs that are paid for by local governments, First Nations, businesses, and taxpayers to help ensure the waste is being managed appropriately. While waste is comprised of many types of materials, an estimated one third of BC's total waste is made up of plastics, paper, and other packaging-like materials, many of which of these materials can be prevented through reuse or recycling programs. In BC, we dispose of a total of about 2.5 million tons of solid waste from our homes and businesses in landfills each year. This is equivalent to over 500 kilograms of waste disposed per person per year. This municipal solid waste is coming from many sources, including homes and residents, but also a significant portion comes from businesses, schools, shopping malls, work sites, and through construction activities. Another way to look at this data that is in BC, over half of the municipal solid waste uh, that's being disposed is made up of highly recyclable or compostable materials when you look at the diagram on the right. As I mentioned, it's about one third of the waste is packaging and packaging, packaging like materials that could be prevented. While over 99% of these British Columbians have access to recycling at home through curbside blue boxes or multifamily building recycling programs or depot services, we know that recycling and waste prevention outside of the home at locations such as offices, retail, retail stores, restaurants, construction sites, and other institutions is not as consistent as the residential program. So 
So with the opportunity, currently there's a variety of regulations and requirements in BC for both residential and non-residential waste. First Nations, local governments, and the provincial government all have important roles to play to ensure municipal solid waste is managed safely and waste prevention recycling programs are prioritized. I'll take a moment to highlight some of the current existing programs to just demonstrate the types of actions underway and it'll help demonstrate why no one approach to solid waste management will solve the non-residential packaging uh, issue alone. So as mentioned, we have the single use and plastic waste prevention regulation that was recently enacted to prevent plastics and packaging waste and phase out certain hard to recycle single use and plastic packaging items such as cutlery shopping bags. And many of these do come from non-residential sources and that regulation targets uh, the product specifically. And it, so that means it applies to both residential and non-residential sources. There's also many programs at the local level, including regional districts who are developing solid waste management plans that are submitted to the ministry for approval. These plans include strategies for preventing and managing municipal solid waste, including recycled materials within their regions. With these solid waste management plans, regional districts have been setting targets to decrease the amount of solid waste disposed and also identifying and implementing programs that will reduce and manage waste within their jurisdictions. This could include local collection facilities, landfill or disposal bans, as well as bylaws or requirements to manage waste facilities and increase the reuse and waste prevention uh, within their region. We've also seen some regional and municipal governments using local bylaws uh, to reduce the use of single use items or require source separation. There's also many examples of BC businesses and institutions that are taking steps to prevent pla pla uh, packaging waste. Actions include material sorting to keep recyclables from entering landfills, promoting plastic and packaging recycling by setting reduction targets, reporting on plastic waste generation overall, and also preventing packaging by switching to reusable food serviceware. With all these existing actions, we know that no one approach will solve the waste management challenges for non-residential packaging and a combination of actions will help produce the best results. I'll now uh, get into the guiding principles and some more of the content um, from within the discussion paper. So with, with all this work, we do have a series of guiding principles that we want to make sure everyone is aware of that helps guide our uh, you know, future progress in this area. So the three guiding principles on the slide I'll just go through, which include a clean environment and climate resilient communities free of waste and pollution, a circular economy, supporting BC businesses and jobs for products and materials for as long as possible. Materials can easily, uh, oh, sorry, materials for as long as possible and materials can easily be repaired, reused and recycled. As well as, and, and important to keep in mind is that we're always building towards true lasting and meaningful reconciliation with indigenous peoples. We wanna make sure that these principles are at the forefront as we move into our outcomes and policy approaches that we're gonna get into. So building on the gu guiding principles, we've developed a series of proposed outcomes that are intended to support the policy approaches that, um, that will be moving forward. So with policy approaches, we wanna consider the entire life cycle of non-residential packaging. So with this full life cycle of packaging, it includes many users that end up being impacted by the packaging choices. This includes the companies involved from the manufacturing of the packaging to the businesses that use the packaging and then the people who end up purchasing the goods and services in this packaging, as well as the communities at large that have to manage the packaging or other providers such as reuse or recycling and the waste industry that provides the services from washing to recycling to help manage the whole system at large. As I go through the desired outcomes, we wanna take a minute for you to consider the following questions and do uh, provide feedback through this engagement about, uh, about them. So with it, when looking at the list and the more details we'll go through, are there any desired outcomes missing from the list? It's also important to highlight what outcomes are most relevant to your business or organization or community. 
We're also looking for input on how, if there's, how you would prioritize these outcomes or how to uh, weigh the differences between them. Finally, we're also looking for indicators or measures of success that you would suggest to help determine if an outcome is being achieved or is achievable. So to get into a few more details about the desired outcomes, I'll start with the prevention first approach. This looks at using the five R waste reduction hierarchy. So with here, the focus on waste reduction and material reuse over recycling first and foremost. Then if, all, if, if no reuse options are available, you then look at recycling over energy recovery or disposal. But with this, we have a strong focus on waste reduction measures and really looking at the opportunity for supporting more reuse solutions. The second outcome is looking at consistency, consistency and confidence. Prevention of packaging is supported and incentivized regardless of location. So with this, we mean that we're looking at access across the province. We're also looking at consistency to reduce consumer confusion. This is looking at ways where programs can be developed that are easy to educate the public and the public can feel confident that the recycling bin in one store takes the same recycling bin as another bin, let's say at home or another location. Um, with this, building more consistency and confidence um, is, a, is a desired outcome to help with the education of the public. The third is around accountability and transparency. And one thing we hear a lot about is that the public needs to be assured that what goes in the recycling bin is being recycled. With this comes accountability and transparency measures where we're looking at what data could be made available and what do we need to track to show progress and ensure that there's accountability and transparency built into the process. The fourth one uh, is to deal with access. And again, this looks at uh, going beyond being, having access across all of BC, but also looking at what are the most cost-effective choices to be managing non-residential packaging. Um, we're also uh, keen to support and are looking for ways to make sure that recycling options in Indigenous communities are prioritized. The fifth outcome is to do with the economic benefits and building a circular economy. Overall, we're looking at ensuring that there's government leadership to support cost-effective, sustainable business practices that are looking at the right market conditions so that we're creating green jobs and what BC is best at for recycling. We know we've had big success uh, with our plastics recyclers and plastics recycling in the region and looking at other ways where economic benefits can be developed in BC with these solutions. Finally, with all this work, we know we need to maximize material recovery to ensure that uh, less uh, packaging waste is ending up in our landfills. So with this, it's looking at how we could increase those recycling to produce higher quality materials and by producing higher quality recycling materials, we know they can be used in the manufacturing of new products and support recycled content uh, requirements or recycled content commitments that are being made by companies across uh, Canada. So with that, I'm now gonna pass it to Aaron who will uh, walk us through a number of po potential policy approaches that were included in the paper. Thanks, Avery. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, the, that Avery mentioned earlier, the policy approaches are ideas being brought forward for discussion and we're really looking for your input and feedback on these and paths forward. Um, so one aspect of the policy approach that could likely be included is target setting. We have heard of the importance and benefit of targets for provi providing focus and supporting measuring success or progress towards a goal. Um, so there's already a variety of targets already in place, either through either for recycling or plastic waste reduction. There are targets federally or under the provincial recycling regulation or provincial solid waste disposal tar targets or through other organizations such as the Canada Plastic Pack. And so we're looking at what type of targets should we, how should we be defining targets, looking at targets for reduction, reuse, recycling, diversion targets. Should there be regional or business specific targets in addition to provincial targets? 
And how do we measure the success or progress against these established targets? For local governments actions, we are, well, we're looking for a provincial approach to preventing non-residential packaging waste. There's all, there are also opportunities and the need for local governments to continue to take actions to address local waste challenges specific to their own needs within communities. And there's opportunities for the provincial government to support these actions and provide guidance or regulations to support a level of provincial consistency. There are examples from the spheres of current uh, jurisdiction, the environment and wildlife regulation under the community charter. Under that, communities have introduced bylaws around single use and plastic items um, before the province introduced provincial regulations. And we've heard through um, organizations or such as UBCM around some of um, these interests. Solid waste management planning will also continue to play an important role and through solid waste management plans, regional districts have enacted landfill disposal bans or other bylaws that can impact the prevention of non-residential packaging waste. We also recognize that First Nations often have unique challenges and considerations regarding non-residential or ICI packaging and waste. And as Avery mentioned earlier, we'll be holding sessions specific for Indigenous people and First Nations to hear more about these considerations and some of the possible solutions. So as we go through the, some of the pol potential policy approaches, we'll be uh, looking uh, to evaluate these potential policy approaches against the proposed desired outcomes that Avery spoke about. And we recognize that this is not a final list. We're also looking to hear about what we're missing, what other opportunities are out there. One approach is a list of designated materials and accompanying actions around those materials. So one of the possible goals of having a list of designated materials would be to support consistency between the residential recycling program and non-residential recycling programs, helping to support the desired outcomes of consistency as well as accountability. And this may also support outcomes of access, maximizing recovery and economic benefits, depending on the actions associated with designated materials list. One example um, that we can look to is in Oregon and some of the work that they're doing around um, materials list there. Designated material list may also help to identify materials that would be eligible for landfill bans. And so another potential policy approach is disposal bans. And we are aware that disposal bans won't work in isolation and require supporting actions to ensure that a ban can be implemented and is followed and effective. There are a variety of materials that could be considered for disposal bans associated with materials that already have recycling or composting options. Corrugated cardboard is one where we've seen disposal bans in different parts of, of BC. Disposal bans also generally apply to all sources and aren't unique to specific sources, such as uh, schools or businesses, but would apply across the, the whole sector, the whole non-residential sector. We have a number of examples of those throughout the province. Reuse requirements and actions are also being seen in more and more jurisdictions and could be uh, taken at specific sources such as events or other closed loop systems. And we've seen um, examples of reuse requirements for food service where in BC, uh, there are also opportunities for reuse in other packaging types, and there are already some examples of business-to-business -business packaging, such as crates or containers or large format packaging or refill systems for cleaning supplies, for example. Any reuse requirements would also involve data collection and monitoring to be able to look at how it's reaching uh, goals and measuring success there. And so we're looking to hear from you as well about how re reuse could be included where are the examples where provincial policy approaches could support increased reuse and prevention of waste? Another potential policy approach is looking at standardized act actions. And there are examples of businesses and institutions, often of a certain size or category, being required to conduct specific actions, such as waste audits or perhaps waste sorting or report on sustainability actions that are being taken. 
guidance on waste planning and actions could be provided by the province to support level of consistency. And this could be applied to all sources or a subset of the non-residential sector. Linked to the standardized actions, provincial data standardization can support data consistency in actions working towards targets or measuring the success of actions. Actions could include the province providing guidance on waste audit categories or data reporting to the province or to other parties to collect, compile, and report out on the data and progress towards waste prevention. There are a number of questions around what data to collect and what data are the most, uh, most important. And so with all of these uh, policy approaches, there are a number of discussion questions that we have identified and, and looking for your feedback on. We're interested in knowing what is already wor working and what other actions should be considered and how ready are businesses and organizations ready to implement any of these um, policy approaches or how actions should be prioritized. We have also heard from a variety of parties, small businesses, local governments, First Nations, that there is a desire for extended producer responsibility to ex be expanded to the non-residential or ICI sector in some form. We already see that our APR covers sources beyond residences for some products, such as beverage containers or some automotive product containers. And as Avery had mentioned, we know that the non-residential sector is diverse and APR may be well suited for some aspects of ICI or non-residential sector, but it won't likely work for the, all aspects of the sector. When looking at the expansion of EPR, we're looking to identify if there are sources such as schools or small businesses that are well suited for expansion of EPR or if materials such as cardboard or business to consumer packaging or locations within the province where EPR may be more appropriate. So within this engagement, we're looking to determine what potential expansion of EPR might look like. How could implementation be prioritized? What are the challenges that need to be considered when evaluating these options? And how do, are there ways to ensure that uh, we support a, pre a prevention first approach uh, is included with this? Similarly, um, there are other opportunities for potential opportunities for expansion of EPR by sector. So we're looking at, are there some non-residential packaging types that are unique and would benefit from EPR specific to that sector? Which sectors or material types are best suited for EPRs? Um, are there unique collection locations or other considered considerations, unique materials that should be considered when looking at EPR expansion by sector? And so with that, that's a summary of the potential policy approaches that have been put forward. And we're looking to have more discussions around these in workshops. There'll be information about the workshops sent up in a follow-up email with sign-up information. The ses sessions have been divided into two groups by topic to be, and we'll have breakout sessions and looking to gather more information, your thoughts and information from that. We'll be having one session on data and standards and looking at the desired outcomes as well as some of the policy approaches associated with data and standards and another session looking at other provincial um, policies, including EPR, as well as, again, the desired outcomes. There are also a number of ways that you can be involved and we're looking for your feedback. Um, engagement is open until July 23rd. And I've mentioned about the workshops, we'll be emailing you with information on how to sign up with that shortly. Uh, we, you can submit written feedback to the circular economy's email address below and uh, below on the slide. And we encourage you to respond to any of the re relevant questions in the discussion paper. And more information about written submissions is available on the Engage BC uh, site with the address on this slide. We also have a short questionnaire that is available and can be uh, to anyone and to the public as well. And we encourage you to complete that questionnaire and share your feedback and it's been an, um, easier accessible way to, to provide feedback as we know that this issue and this topic can impact it, everyone. And so with that, I think we will have some time for some questions. And at this point, we will be able to, to stop the recording.